free trade, one of the greatest blessings a government can bestow on its people, is in almost every country unpopular. So wrote Lord Macaulay, the Whig politician, the historian, poet, and Indian administrator. He wrote those words in 1824. Think of how much more aptly they apply today. Which is extraordinary, isn't it? Because since Lord Macaulay's time, according to uh, Deirdre McCluskey's calculations, the human race has experienced something like a 3,000% increase in living standards as a result of globalization and increased specialization and exchange. Free trade was, prior to the coronavirus, mopping up the last few remaining puddles of poverty on the planet. And the effect was most marked, particularly in those Asian and African countries that were leaving previously closed, autarkic, uh, self-reliant systems and joining the global economy. So why is it, when we've seen the miraculous effects, that it's so unpopular? Why is it, when we've seen the extraordinary falls in uh, infant mortality, in adult mortality, in diseases, when we've seen the extraordinary rises in education and so on, why, when we've seen the pacifying effects of free trade, the way in which since 1945 countries have been less likely to go to war with each other because they don't have to quarrel and squabble about resources anymore, why are we opposing the thing that has worked this wonder? Well, I've given this a lot of, a thought, a lot of thought, and I think there are three fundamental explanations, and I'm going to group them broadly as follows. There's a psychological explanation, a political explanation, and what I can only call an aesthetic explanation. Let's start with the psychological one. Free trade just feels wrong, right? It feels weird. It doesn't accord with the instincts and intuitions that were embedded by a million years of human intuitions. We have an instinct that makes us want to hoard food so as to get through the winter, right? We want to be able to see it there. We don't want to rely on invisible strangers. And so the uh, assertions made by the mercantilists and the protectionists, we need to protect our strategic industries, we need to make sure we've got enough food grown in our own country, we, we can't compete with poor countries with slave wages, we, we can't afford a permanent trade balance. All of those things feel right. They are intuitive. But every single one, when turned into policy, serves to make a country poorer than it needed to be. And that's why in every generation, from Macaulay's to ours, the perfectionists and the mercantilists have always been able to make this uh, appeal to what seems like common sense. And then there's the, the political reason, and I can summarize that in four words. Free trade brings dispersed gains, concentrated losses. When Donald Trump uh, applies steel tariffs, he may very slightly slow the decline of the US steel sector. He may prop up, at least for a few years, some of the 125,000 odd jobs in steel production. But at a far greater cost in the 7 million downstream steel using sectors, construction, aeronautics, car building, and all the rest. It is always and everywhere true that trade restrictions do damage net to the country that applies them. But the politics don't always match the economics. So let's suppose that the, the steel tariffs were taken off tomorrow. Right? Immediately the US economy would get a slight boost. Prices would fall. All of those companies that use them in construction and car making and so on would get an immediate productivity boost without needing to do anything else. They'd be able, other things being equal, to take on more workers. Those workers would start paying taxes. Everyone would be a little bit better off. And at the end of that process, not one American would say, ah, I'm $64 better off this year or whatever it is. I'm going to vote for the guy who took that tariff off. But the losers, the uh, former steel workers in Flint, Michigan, or whatever it is, they will know exactly whom to blame and they will vote accordingly. And that's why countries again and again act against their interests because the politics dictate it. The most flagrant example of this in the US, by the way, is sugar. American sugar is about twice the price 
of global sugar, right? It, it's quoted separately in a lot of stock exchanges, and that's been true almost since the revolution. Why? Because there is a sugar-producing lobby based in Florida that heavily funds both parties, that runs PACs, and that has lobbied extensively to keep sugar out of the US. Result? Well, many more jobs are lost in downstream industries, in confectionery and candy making. There's a reason, right, that those American chocolate bars taste bad. It's because they're made with corn syrup, because the sugar uh, is out of reach. And yet, because the sugar jobs are concentrated in Florida, because Florida is a key state, <laughs> no administration is ever going to say, I would rather have six or seven or eight more jobs downstream in food processing, because those people don't know who they are. They can't vote for me. I will prop up uh, the powerful and well-connected lobby in Florida. So we've got the psychological problem, we've got the political problem, which brings me onto what I can only call the aesthetic problem, right? The Victorian novelist Anthony Trollope once said, poverty, to be scenic, should be rural. And I think that sentiment underlines an awful lot of the thinking behind Western aid and development. I grew up in Lima, Peru. Lima in the 1970s was a city surrounded by shanty towns. They stretched away in all directions on the slopes of the surrounding hills. Barriadas, they were called, Las Barriadas de Lima. And what would happen when I was growing up? Friends would come from Britain, from Europe, from the US, and they would do the usual thing that people do when they visit Peru, right? They would stay with us for a few days, and then they'd fly to Cusco, they'd visit Machu Picchu, they'd do the Inca Trail, they'd come back, and almost always, almost always, they would ask the same question. Why is it, they would say, why is it that people are leaving these pristine, beautiful Andean villages and coming down here to the slums to live among the open sewers and the traffic fumes? That was a very first world question. No Peruvian ever needed to ask why somebody would leave a mountain village where there was no electricity, no clean running water, no clinic, no school, no job. The people in the shanty towns, the people in the barriadas, understood in a way that some Western aid analysts affect not to or maybe don't understand that the slum is a transitional phase, transitional for the individual passing through it and transitional in the developmental phase of the country. Britain went through the same process, so did every other industrialized nation. And you come out of it richer, longer lived, with better education, with better living standards in every way. But of course, it's not pretty, right? And so we've built this whole industry in our school textbooks, in our documentaries, in our government policy based around a fundamentally aesthetic objection that says, oh, how awful, here are these poor women in Vietnam, you know, stitching sneakers together for 50 cents a day or whatever it is. Well, you wouldn't want to work in a sweatshop in Vietnam, neither would I. But let's not deny agency to the people involved. Let's consider that they might be making a rational, self-interested decision. You and I have not faced an alternative of bending our backs in the paddy fields dawn to dusk. And maybe, maybe those employees understand that it's a transitional phase. Maybe they understand that the wages earned by an employee of a foreign country, a uh, company in a country like Vietnam, are roughly twice the national average. And certainly they would understand that if we really want to help them, you know what we can do? We can buy more of their stuff and we can sell them more of our stuff cheaply. And that will raise living standards. And as it raises living standards and puts upward pressure on wages, so it will improve working conditions. It's the same process that every country goes through as long as there is a free market system. Now, here is the depressing thing. All of those arguments were hard enough to win in 2019, before the coronavirus struck. They are going to be much harder to win coming out of the epidemic and its associated lockdowns. They're going to be much harder to win with a world population that has now been habituated over the last 12 months to a far warier and more protectionist and more introverted outlook. The number of people who have said to me over the past year things like, well, surely, Hannan, even you, even you must now understand why we need to grow more of our own food. Oh, come on, really? Really, that's, that's your take 
from the last 12 months? The coronavirus hit this country at the height of what our farmers call the hungry gap, right? That period between late March and early May when we do not produce any food in any quantity in this country. We've reached the end of the, the winter harvests. Right? We're not uh, producing any more cabbages or potatoes or turnips. We haven't yet reached the first of the main harvests. Had it not been for the ability to import what we needed when we needed it, we would have been living on rhubarb and asparagus, maybe a little bit of nettle soup. That is what we grow during the hungry gap. But of course, imports function perfectly well. The real lesson we should have learned over the past 12 months is how important imports are. If the vaccine row, the rush to be able to get your hands on vaccines produced wherever they are in the world teaches us one thing, it should be that. But of course, we're not looking at this with our rational minds. We're looking at it with our caveman instincts. Of course we do. It's what people do in a crisis. So I'm afraid that free marketeers, people who have got some knowledge of economics and how it works empirically, are going to need to go back to first principles and explain these necessarily counterintuitive and difficult truths, that the best way to spread wealth and opportunity, the best way to spread peace and happiness, is by removing obstacles and allowing businesses and customers to interact without government interference. It's the same basic formula that works every time. It raised Britain to be the richest country in the world in the 19th century. Same magic formula that worked for Hong Kong and Singapore in the 20th century, for Australia and New Zealand in the 21st. Find me a free trading country anywhere in the world that is not over time getting significantly richer. But we need to go out and show why that works. Because it seems surprising, it seems to run up against common sense. So let's go out and make the most basic moral case in the way that Lord Macaulay would have done for free trade as the ultimate instrument of poverty alleviation, of conflict resolution, and of social justice.